I haven't made anything in quite some time. <laughs> hey guys, sorry it took so long. I just wasn't feeling good about anything. Anyways, I've compiled a list of my favorite 22 movies from the last decade, starting with number 22, Young Adult. This is gonna take all day. Who made this list? This movie is like the self-esteem movement gone awry. If you just took all the worst qualities about my generation and you just shoved them into one person. Psychotic prom queen, bitch. There's Charlize Theron, or I don't know however you say her name. She's South African. Charlize Theron. I just like her. I'm such a fan. We gotta pick this up. Blue Jasmine. I quote this movie all the time, specifically that part. I saw you, Erica. I saw you, Erica. You watch Kate Blanchett slowly losing her mind over the course of the two hours. It's such a good performance. It won her an Oscar, but I still think it's underrated. And the Oscar goes to Kate Blanchett. The world is round, people. Extraordinary screenplay by Woody Allen. Oh yeah, Woody Allen. Whoops. Oh, it also stars Alec Baldwin. And Louis C.K. And the film was produced by Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> These women. How many lesbian sex scenes does it take to get into my best of the decade list? Apparently two and a half. Okay, let's talk about the cast. You got Emma, Rachel, Olivia. The dynamic trio. Emma Stone, who I've been in love with since that scene in Easy A. Not that one, the one where she hobs on the bed with her gay friend to help him stay in the closet. Yeah, awesome. yeah. What an ally. Taylor Swift is quaking. Rachel Weiss. She's been on my gaydar since The Mummy. I wouldn't mind if she was my mummy. If you know what I mean. Step mummy. Olivia Coleman. Ah! So repulsive in this. But in real life, she's just the loveliest lady. Oh, thank you so much, um, Lady Gaga. Truly the best Oscars acceptance speech, my favorite of all time. Olivia Coleman. Ah! Uh. <laughs> This is hilarious. The number two best awards acceptance speech behind Alice Ripley and the Tonys. Alice Ripley. But for our contribution to the human spirit, politics. Tangled. I forgot I put her on there. Fun fact, Tangled costs more to make than all three Lord of the Rings movies combined. And why? Because of hair. I'm paying for Disney Plus, I guess exclusively to watch the Mother Knows Best reprise every morning until I'm dead. They kill that woman. It's so funny if you watch the trailers for Tangled, they were so afraid that no boy would ever go see it. All the trailers are just Flynn Rider. This is a boys movie for Flynn Rider. This is not about girls. It is not about hair. Ignore the hair. The hair is not a thing. Meanwhile, at Disney HQ. Let's just throw another 50 million at her hair, okay guys? Ah! I could have picked Inside Out, I could have picked Toy Story 3, but I didn't. Why? Because those are films and Tangled is a movie. It's not deep. It's not like an intellectual time. It's like just wrapping myself in like a warm, comfortable blanket of basic. Can't wait to force feed it to my stupid kids. Oh, annihilation. Wait, okay. How? One, two, three, four. Literally the entire list is just movies about women. Gravity. Gravity! Sandra Bullock plays a woman in this one. And against me. Oh, a little flat on that run. But I'm not a professional singer, luckily. I stopped doing that about a year ago. <laughs> I think I'll try to fight in gravity against me. Oh. Still got it, fellas. <laughs> How did you slip in there? Just when you thought he couldn't do anything worse to his career, then he comes out as a Prometheus stand. The best part of this movie is the women. Oh, and, and the big gay robot in the room. Now he plays basketball, okay? He could be straight. Maybe he's bi. Bi robot. No, no, because in the next Alien movie, doesn't he kiss himself? <laughs> I don't know, some weird shit. This movie gets a lot of hate because people say the characters act really irresponsibly for, you know, scientists who are maybe on a mission to save the Earth or whatever. But listen, the mission isn't being funded by like NASA. It's being privately funded by a billionaire. Like we're talking like an Elon Musk type and like that science frat attitude. It always rang true to me. If you look at the, some of the stuff Elon Musk and company do. Oh my fucking- Is it really so much of a stretch that you have all the white guys broing it up on the new planet while the women and the black guy try to hold it down? It was so wrong. Once upon a time, I love. Finally. Men. 
Take that, Elizabeth Warren. Quentin Tarantino's just my favorite. In an age where I'm trying desperately to dick down your attention span, Quentin Tarantino's like, hey, you wanna watch Feet for 20 minutes? Who here wants to look at Feet for 20 minutes? Nobody? I'm gonna do it anyway. Come on. 1969 is so cool. The revisionist history Tarantino movies are just so full of love. He changes history, he lets the good guys win. Okay. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a tonal shift because this next movie, it's the only documentary on the list, but it's about genocide. So, you know when you're a kid, they're like, the Nazis were bad, they killed six million Jews, and you're like, okay, I get it, but also, how did they do that? This movie illuminates how genocide occurs by interviewing warlords who committed a genocide in Indonesia like 50 years prior, who are still in power, and the filmmaker encourages them the warlords to reenact their genocide because they all think he's making like a saving private Ryan for Indonesia or something. It is a bananas documentary. I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I was watching it. And it lost the best documentary Oscar to 20 feet from bullshit. It's hard to talk about this movie because I'm not that smart. Eee, guys, oh my gosh, Silver Lightning's playbook. Okay, the rom-com formula, you got two, Hot people who would be together if not for some contrivance, okay? Eventually they overcome that contrivance and then they live happily ever after. And this movie is like, what if we took that contrivance just like boop, and instead made it so that they're both fucking crazy? <laughs> I want to be a crazy slut! I'm not sorry. This movie says the reason you are not happy in relationships is because of your own brain. And that's of course true. But also this movie, it's so infused with hope. Yes, you might be broken, but you can find other people who can specifically put up with that brokenness and who you can put up with their brokenness. To me, it's like, oh, how do you revive the rom-com? Oh, you make it about bad relationships because almost everybody I know is in one. Uh oh, it's a foreign film. I don't wanna read. You want me to read during a movie? I'm supposed to be looking at the pictures. No, Parasite rocks, you lazy little sh**. This better win best picture at the Oscars this year or we riot. This is like a Korean Alfred Hitchcock movie. Uh, just when Timothy Chalamet piqued my curiosity about peaches, now I can't even look at a peach without getting a shiver down my spine. Parasite ruined sexting for me. I like movies that are weird, but not random. Like you don't know what's gonna happen next, but you can trust that it's gonna make sense. And that's what Bong Joon-ho does so good in all of his movies. He didn't know a parasite would translate to American audiences. And then he said this in an interview. We all live in the same country, capitalism. It's beautiful. Yeah, capitalism exploits certain bourgeois. Okay, I don't know anything about capitalism, but Movies are not an intellectual enterprise, they're an emotional enterprise. And this movie made me feel what capitalism. Ha! Ah! Y'all know what's next? Come on. Goes a little something like this. Goes a little something like, ooh. Goes a little something like, dum 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 ba dum ba dum 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 scum dum scum ba dum dum scum scum scum. This is a weirdly controversial movie. I went to the premiere of this movie. I met Davy and Chazelle. He was so nice. He talked to me for a while and I liked his movie. But you know, I wasn't, you know, cause like Ryan Gosling ain't Bing Crosby. Awesome. Okay, crooner. <laughs> Gosh, first Parasite and then OK Crooner. I've lost you. Reeling it back. And the second time I saw it, I was running 102 degree fever. My girlfriend dragged me to it. And for some reason, I was annoyed by the film. It's just like, why are they, are they breaking up? Or like, why is John Legend so bad at jazz? It sounds like jazz made by those racist caricature transformers. Why don't you get a haircut with your bitch ass? A couple months went by, me and this girl broke up. And I watched it again because I was super sad and it destroyed my life. It killed me. Just tears streaming down my face. And really, I'm like a tough nut to crack. Like I don't cry for anything. You should ask my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> but for this, for La La Land, I am sappy, soppy, soaking wet trash. I'm a trash man. I'm a garbage person. I like Emma Stone. I like Ryan Gosling. Excuse me for feeling joy. Guys, Brooks and Beagle.
wallflower. These are such good movies. I think I have good taste. Okay, let me set the stage. I'm 20 years old. I'm in a deep transition in my life, moving from one college to another. I am just terrible at like life transitions in general. And this one was a damn doozy because I just loved high school. I still think it's my favorite part of my life. <laughs> and that's why coming of age movies are so effective for me because I've, I've essentially like buried my high school experience because it's too painful to like revisit all the time. But this movie just like ripped open my memory bank and like let the, the blood flow. I went into this movie completely blind with no expectations and came out of it just a, a mess. I went to my Facebook, I tagged every single one of my like high school theater buddies and I wrote this. I've obviously since put this on private, put it under lock and key, and now I reveal it for all to see. It's titled, and in that moment, I swear we were infinite. Okay, it's not MLA format, but go off queen. Oof. I don't know if I can read this. How I wished rehearsals would stretch on so a senior could teach me something new about growing up or sex. Golly. How I didn't know what loneliness meant and I didn't care. Oh my gosh, this is so sad. And I keep forgetting what it felt like to really love my friends and love my life and live every day without considering my mortality. You get the picture. I'm a very emotional person with no way to cope. And this was just like, Clearly, it was the perfect coming of age movie for that kid. Oh my. This. Boo boo. This movie's a dang masterpiece, okay? It's as close as we're ever gonna get to like a Ray Bradbury dystopia. They keep taking actual Ray Bradbury masterpieces and turning them into YA shit. This is one of the best feminist films of all time. One of the best movies warning us against climate change of all time. That you either save the planet or drink breast milk. It's your decision, Donald. Probably the best movie featuring nipple piercings. This is the best use of Verdi's Requiem of all time. And believe me, there are plenty of other examples. <laughs> This is probably the best movie made by a guy in his freaking 70s. This bitch is getting his grand slam half off at IHOP. I will go on record, this is the best action movie of all time. I'm sorry, Tom, um, Tom Hanks. What is that guy's name? Tom Clancy? Tom Scientology Hanks. Tom Hardy, but he's in the movie. Tom. Cruise. <sighs> okay, well, there's a new Tom in town. Dick. Ooh, no. Don't watch it. I literally could not sleep the night I watched it. I would think about it and get chills like there was a ghost around me. This is not a ghost story, okay? The devil does not say boo, bitch. Audiences hated this movie. They gave it a D plus cinema score. For context, they gave cats a C plus. It features one of the most realistic portrayals of grief. Tony Collette gives my favorite performance of the decade by far. It is my favorite horror movie ever. Don't see it. Don't watch it. Talking about it makes me want to pee. Ari Aster is a son of a bitch. He's an evil filmmaker. Watch out, plebs. We got another foreign film. It's just an amazing script. It unfolds like a tightly wound clock. I'm like too stupid to talk about it good, but it's on Netflix. Just watch the first scene. I think you'll like it and then carry on from there. Wow. Uh, I worked at a movie theater in high school. I got paid like seven bucks an hour. Yes, exploit me, daddy. The one good thing about that job I saw movies for free, and I saw this movie in IMAX four times, and it's a long ass movie. This was my Star Wars. It was a movie that like redefined the limits of the medium and pushed the boundaries of what like a movie could be. Christopher Nolan is one of the last filmmakers who can get like a hundred million dollar budget for an idea he just came up with, not based on any previous like intellectual property. He just dreamt it up, worked his ass off, and got a hundred million dollar check to make his dream movie. Okay, Lennon Tipton going insane, worth the price of admission alone. Oh my gosh, now you have an emergency? Full disclaimer. Disclaimer? I really don't like Facebook. I have some sour grapes. Cause they made a bunch of money off re-uploading my videos for years without giving me any credit. So suck my smoked meat, Mark Zucker Frank. John, bring it back, the movie. The movie. <coughs> the movie's not kind to Zark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember, but murmurs of this movie were like going around. It seems so obvious now that like, of course, Social Network, one of the best movies ever. But like at the time, people were like the Facebook movie, what? Whatever your reaction when they announced the Emoji movie, that's what people were saying about the Facebook movie. We were all wrong. 
And I can admit I'm wrong, unlike other people. Uh, this movie's really famous for that, that breakup scene, but the whole movie's a breakup. It's a breakup of a bromance. And like any good breakup, the only one there to pick up the pieces is Justin Timberlake. Tearing up my heart. I think the main reason this movie's great is because you have the double whammy of two powerhouse artists with very distinct styles. You have Aaron Sorkin with like a penchant for melodramatic dialogue with all this Shakespearean gravitas. Sorry, my brothers and the cleaners! Along with my hoodie and my Quack. you flip flops. But then you have David Fincher, who makes sure all the actors deliver that dialogue with like the utmost earnestness and the look of the film, just gorgeous. David Fincher is known for making these like cold, calculated films with like a mechanical soul. I can't think of a better guy to direct a movie about Mark Sucker. Quack. People are doubtful about this movie because it looks boring and it's foreign. It's like it's black and white. The protagonist, she could be anybody. Everything about this movie is saying, don't watch me. But this movie moved me more than any film I've ever seen. It's like you're living in Alfonso Cuaron's memories. I heard Alfonso Cuaron talking about his process for creating the film. It's just so ballsy. You have been always very obsessed about the anti-narrative film, like how the film can be liberated from narrative. There's, uh, there's an artificiality narrative. Sometimes films are hostages of that artificiality. Yeah. It's a safety net. And I here wanted to do a process without safety nets, a process that I really didn't know how to do. The actors never had the screenplay. The, the crew never had the screenplay. It's emotionally with a congruence and a narrative and a rhythm that is pure melody. I love that, it's pure melody. The cast had no idea where the characters were gonna end up. Every day they would just show up, get the script, shoot the movie. And what you get is like a movie that unfolds like life unfolds. Every scene is kind of like this, but there's this one scene where you have this guy, he's like in an apartment complex doing karate with a pole. He's completely naked. He looks super goofy. And then the film cuts to the protagonist and she's just so taken by him. Like he's doing like a mating dance. And it's just such a bizarre scene that works perfectly. It's like full of subtext, but also kind of meaningless too. And the movie is never telling you how you're supposed to feel. It's just presenting memories. But that's not to say that this movie is told at a small scale. It feels like there's a huge budget behind it. Like in the background of one scene, there's just like a dozen cars carrying a hundred men away. There's scenes of like absolute chaos, destruction, mayhem, riots. And by the end, that scale is just overwhelming. I broke down. I did not stop crying until the credits were over and they brought the lights up. This was the first time in a drama where I had to tell myself like, this is just a movie because I was so overwhelmed. I was making noise, crying and embarrassing myself. So. so I would recommend you watch this film privately, make sure it's dark, put your phone away. And I think if you're patient with it, it might have a really profound effect on you. Images from this movie will just come up in my mind and fill me with like this serene sense of calm. The photography in this movie is just breathtaking. It's my favorite of any film I've ever seen. It's like the scope of that Planet Earth show. You see the origins of the universe played literally over opera music. And they got the same guy who did the trippy space sequences in 2001 A Space Odyssey. He also did the sequences in this movie with absolutely no CGI, which is just mind blowing. The whole thing is so epic. But then you have this very intimate coming of age story about this kid growing up in Texas with like a very strict father and a loving mother. And you're seeing these two forces battle it out as he grows up. I grew up religious, but I started to lose my religion around the time this movie came out. Seeing this movie, I still consider it the most spiritual experience of my life. Like it put church to shame, really. It's just a really special movie. And I hate to keep mentioning the Oscars, but. For best original score. Ludovic Bourges, the artist. For achievement in directing. Michelle have an issue. In cinematography. Hugo, Robert Richardson. Best picture, Tom Cruise. The artist. How did that movie win Best Picture? Oh, oh hi Harvey. The number one movie goes to, one second. When did there will be blood? 2007? I hadn't even come yet. The number one, sorry. Who can one up God? Greta Gerwig, bitch. Lady Bird. Ah! 
we did it. Did you not see this coming? You know I'm a slut for coming of age. The Oscars should have a best Lady Bird award and just give it to Lady Bird every year. I just sat down in a theater. I was relieved of my conscious mind for the next two hours. I laughed so much. This is the funniest movie I'd ever seen. I cried. I cried through laughing. I laughed through crying. This movie gave birth to my fantasy threesome of Sir Ronan and Timothy Chalamet. The Lucas Hedges character, I just identified with that guy so much. This is my personal favorite. I don't know. It's the only Blu-ray I've purchased in the last eight years. And I bought the Blu-ray knowing full well I wasn't gonna watch it anytime soon. Cause the movie's just so special, I gotta give it space. I just have a religious reverence for this movie. That's it. That's the list. We did it. Oh my gosh, great. The world is round, people. So please wrap up, right, okay. So John, where have you been? It's been a year. Well, guys, interesting story. It's not interesting at all. I live in LA. I've been working on screenwriting for the past year. The thing is, screenwriting is so hard. I'm just trying to have fun on YouTube again. Honestly, if you're still around and watching this type of content, I really deeply appreciate you. Thanks for being here. I'm gonna use paint chips just to kind of mess around. So if you wanna leave comments about like maybe something you'd wanna see from me, it's really good to see y'all. And uh, I'll see you next time. Okay.